Uh, unless you're, oh, there it goes. All right. Well, John Joseph Adams, thank you so much for joining today. I've been looking forward to talking to you for some time. Hmm. Oh, well, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. So just real quick, uh, you're the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy and the New York Times bestselling editor of more than 40 anthologies, such as Wastelands, A People's Future of the United States, and most recently out there screaming with Jordan Peele, which is incredible. I can't wait to talk some more about that uh, in a little bit. But uh, when people devote their lives to books, I'm always interested in where it started. Do you have uh, a book when you were young or a writer that mm -hmm. really captured your your readerly imagination? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, basically, uh, the book, uh, The Stars My Destination by Alfred Bester, that's kind of like responsible for me becoming an editor. Um, because I was working at a Walden Books at the time, um, which is one of these like little small um, mall bookstores that we used to have before Barnes and Noble, uh, you know, sort of put them all out of business. Um, that was and, my first um, store when I was a kid too. Yeah, yeah, right. And so um, my my the town I lived in wasn't big enough for like a Barnes and Noble or a Borders, and so we had we had a Walden Books and a B Dalton. Um, but I worked at the Walden Books, and um, you know, we had like a pretty small science fiction section, and you know, we used to, this is before Amazon uh, was, maybe it was around, but it wasn't the big thing it was. And so people would come in and would special order books all the time. Um, and every now and then there'd be a book that like, we just get a run on and like a bunch of people keep ordering it. And you're always like, you're always like, well, why are, why is everybody ordering this? Like, was this on TV or something? Like sometimes like if it's uh, if some, some talk show talked about a book, then people would come order it. Um, and so this was happening with Stars My Destination. Um, and what happened was it had been out of print for a really long time um, because Alfred Bester left his literary estate to his bartender. Uh, like, that's for real. Um, <laughs> and his bartender didn't know what to do with it. And so all, all of his books went out of print. Um, and um, Byron Price, who uh, was a publisher for a long time, um, he uh, he had like untangled the web of rights and he got the you know rights to Bester's work back and he got, got them back into print. And so Vintage had had re-released the Starsman Destination. Um, anyway, so it's like, you know, we get all these book, these copies of the book in, and I'm like looking at it, I'm like, this looks really interesting. I, I didn't know who Bester was. I, I wasn't even sure it was science fiction at first. It looked cool. And then I read the back and I was like, well, that sounds awesome. And and so I just kind of read it, you know, uh, um, you know, taking a taking a taking a shot at the unknown and um and it just like blew my mind. Um, you know, because I mean it was written in the fifties, but like he was way ahead of his time. Like uh, he was a, a really accomplished stylist, like much more so than most science fiction fantasy writers of that era. Uh, now it's more common, but back then it was pretty rare for somebody to be as much of a stylist as he is or was. Um, and, uh, but then, and it's just like, you know, the, the structure of it and the ideas and, and some of the daring stuff that he does in it. It's just like, it's just an incredible book. Um, and so, Basically, it's like I started reading with the idea of wanting to capture that same kind of mind blown feel that I got when I was reading that book. Um, and so, you know, I just kept plowing through books and I kept digging into new authors and trying to find other things that might, you know, elicit that same response. And, um, you know, that kind of led me to uh, toward the path of editing. I mean, there were other factors that that pointed me there, too, but but that was that's kind of like what I feel like is my origin story. And was Bester writing like in the forties? Uh, yeah, like the forties and fifties. Um, and uh, I think he died in the nineties. And so like um, he, I think he was, uh, he, he was mostly, he was mostly wasn't writing very much for uh, some, some period of time. Like I think a couple of decades actually. Um, so like, but most of his notable work is from the fifties. Um, so like, actually, yeah. So he, um, uh, his other his other big book, The Demolished Man, um, that actually won the first Hugo Award for Best Novel. So it's like that sort of puts into perspective like how <laughs> how classic of an author he is. It's like, um, you know, so um, it just happens that that around that time is when the Hugo started. So, you know, he just happened to be lucky that he was writing at the time and, um, you know, he had the book of the year that year. So <laughs> was he sort of influenced by like hard boiled fiction at the time? Because it was really pulpy back then yeah 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 um i mean i'm not really sure what his uh direct influences like that were um i know he wrote in he 
he wrote a lot of nonfiction. I think he worked at a magazine. I think it was called Holiday or something. Um, it was like some kind of glossy, like, you know, lifestyle magazine or something. Um, so that was like his day job. And then he, he also ended up, he also like wrote for Green Lantern. Like he wrote the Green Lantern Oath. Comic books, right? Um, yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, I think he had like just like a million different influences, but um, really? it's been a minute. Like I, I read a bunch of interviews with him at some point because I was like, I kind of just wanted to know more about him. And uh, but it's been so long that I just sort of most of most of that has gone out of my head. Um, but that was kind of actually kind of a fun uh, scavenger hunt, like to dig up these interviews that I can find. Because, you know, I mean, it's not like these are like online somewhere where you can just go read them because it's like these, they're from so long ago. Um, so I, I like had to buy like a couple different uh, like out of print books that were like, uh, you know, collections of interviews from this person, collections of interviews from that person. And then it's like, so it's like the, I bought it for the one thing for the one interview in there that I wanted to read. Um, uh, <laughs> but so anyway. Uh, what, what was it that sort of blew your mind about that particular book? You were talking about style. Yeah. And I assume you'd read like sci-fi fantasy stuff before that. And yeah. so something about this book distinguished it Maybe style was part of it, but I assume you were reading more contemporary stuff before mm -hmm. you came across his book. Yeah. Uh, like, what was it about what he was doing or how he was doing it that seemed to distinguish it from other things that you've yeah. been reading? Uh, well, I think most of the science fiction I read at that time was uh, w written in a very straightforward uh, sort of invisible prose style where like, you know, it, the prose was just to communicate the story and the characters and stuff without any real attention to the to the style of it, which is a style in of its own. I mean, that works great for a lot of the stories. Um, but what Bester did was he really brought this, you know, distinct style to his his work where the writing itself was, you know, exciting. Uh, I'm getting just goosebumps just thinking about thinking about the book and it's like you know some of the turns of phrase and everything in there that were like you know not dialogue but just like descriptions of things um and uh i mean just like uh if you read like the prologue of that book uh just like the first paragraph is just amazing um i used to be able to like quote it but it's like it's very it's very like convoluted and like really hard to remember um so that's like that's amazing um but then also and then if, if you skip ahead to chapter one like the first line of chapter one is also amazing it's uh he was 170 days dying and not yet dead um and it's uh it's about this guy gully foil who is a a mechanic on um a spaceship and uh there's basically there was some kind of accident and he's stuck on this ship uh you know and he's been on there for 170 days and he's alone it's like the ship is like the the hull is breached you know there's like hardly any place for him to actually survive in there like you know i, I can't remember exactly the details but it's like you know he, he has to wear like a space suit and he has to do like these daring things just to say stay alive um you know looking like trying to find anything to eat and and all kinds of things um and um yeah and it's just like it, it starts off in this really cool place but then it's like um yeah, it just goes in all these weird directions. Like, I mean, the the gully foil that starts that book is so different from the one that ends the book that it's like, uh, it's like, if, I mean, you know, obviously that's the goal of any sort of character journey, but that journey is just really something. Um, and then like one thing that Bester also did was that I that I had never seen before at that time was he did these really interesting, um, like sort of, uh, um, you know, sort of out there uh uh use of typesetting so like uh there's some weird stuff that happens sort of toward the end of the book um and and it's like it's weird for the character but then it's it's partially rendered in the book by him doing these different things with typography where like a word is like you know written and it's like uh the 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 letters are like uh done sort of like in a step you know, across the page, right, like right. to the right and then back down, you know, so it's like a zigzag of words and, and things like that. And like all, all, all manner of things. It's like, um, it's kind of impossible to describe, but it's, you'd, you'd have to see it. But, um, but so I thought that was really cool too. Cause it was like, it, it, it was using, it was using, um, the tools that he had in order to communicate this sense of strangeness. And I think it really did a, a good job. Um, cause it's like, what the character was experiencing was so strange that it would be kind of hard to to use just regular words without having that visual um you know that visual distinction that he was making so 
yeah, there's a kind of interiority that it brings to the character when writers are experimenting with with style in that way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, was that around that? So you would have been a. You said you were at Walden Books. Yeah. Were you a teenager or were you sort of college age at that time? Yeah, I was. I was like eighteen when I was working there. Um, it was like my second job. Um, and um, yeah, this was in this was like ninety five or something like that. Ninety four, ninety five. Um, I don't know exactly. Like I was there. I was there for about a year and a half, so it was somewhere around then. And was um, that around the time that you thought that uh, books might be your career? That you might. Um, I mean, it was kind of. Yeah, it was kind of a pipe dream at that point. You know, I mean, I didn't really think it would happen. I mean, I, you know, I lived in a small town in Florida and I wasn't like, you know, I really had no idea what the roadmap was. Um, you know, my, so my, my, my path toward editing started with like this desire to find things, like I said, from, re- from reading Stars My Destination, but then also it was uh, from my interest in writing that I had developed um, around the same time, um, which, and that 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 came from my other big influence which was dungeons and dragons yeah um uh it's like my favorite thing in the world um and i've been playing it like my whole life and so back then um i was in a regular group and i was just and i and i loved it um and at some point i just was like sort of taken over by this desire to create something and so my first thought was to do something in D because it was like you know oh well that's the only thing i can think of really you know like i didn't think of it like oh i could write a book or i could write whatever um so i i you know i just tried to do to like run a run a game for my friends and it was like and i just hated that like i i had fun writing the adventure and everything but then i hated the interactive part of it like and it still kind of stresses me out today like uh like i go back and forth whether or not whether or not I like DMing, it's like there's parts of it I love, parts of it. I mean, I love playing, um, but there's parts of DMing that I love and parts of it that just sort of stress me out. Um, but I wasn't ready for it at the time, and so um, my uh, my brother-in-law at the time, uh, who was our main DM, he uh, he was like, "Oh, well, why don't you try try writing a short story?" You know, it's like I didn't even really know what a short story was at the time, um, and so um, uh, this was like seventeen, eighteen, yeah. Oh, okay. um, you know, somewhere it was all around the same time. Um, um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of looked around and I, um, you know, I was struggling to find uh, like good references for short stories because like our, our store was so small. The science fiction section was very small. So like we didn't even really have any anthologies or anything. I had to go find all of that stuff on my own later. Like uh, Ben Bova was one of the first uh, like sort of core meat and potatoes um you know, science fiction writers I was reading. Um, and so I was reading everything I could, but we only had a few books of his. And so like, I was going to use bookstores and buying up everything. And um, so he actually had been the editor of Analog for several years, um, which is one of the big science fiction fantasy magazines at the time. Um, and it's still around. Um, but um, so his collections, uh, when I found them uh, of his short stories, uh, it had a lot of like, you know, uh, author notes in the front of the story and it's like talking about like the culture of science fiction like the convention scene and all this stuff like this larger world that was out there about science fiction and fantasy that i had no idea existed um like the only convention i had ever heard of was like star trek conventions and like dragon con uh and i'd never been to any of them um i had no idea the things like world con were out there um so um so anyway yeah so like it was only it was only later that I, I eventually found all of these um, Ben Bova collections, and then I eventually found anthologies and things like that. Um, but at the time, like I didn't really know about short stories, um, and uh, so I ended up the first thing I wrote was a novel, um, and it was terrible, you know, as most most first attempts to write a novel are. Um, but you know, it was like it, it taught me a lot of discipline. Like I I was actually it's it's actually funny thinking back how diligent I was because I mean I was you know I was at that age you know 17 18 and um I was going to work and I was coming home and I was just I was I was banging out those words man like I I uh, and you know so um yeah I mean it was it was a cool experience because I mean like I know a lot of people start novels and they don't finish them and the fact that I actually the first thing I did was I I actually wrote the end and and finished the novel I was like well hey that's pretty cool that I did that but um you know, uh, when I went to college, I, you know, I ended up studying writing and everything. And so, um, you know, in the workshop process, you know, you, you're in a writing workshop class, for instance, you know, it's like, you know, I was workshopping stories, but then I was also providing feedback to the other authors. And so that's when I kind of 
got the itch for editing as a possible career path. It's like when I was, you know, when I was doing the hunting for uh, after Stars My Destination, that was all kind of like theoretical. That was just like for for getting that 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 high, that dopamine hit of of that discovery. Um, it wasn't. I hadn't really put it together. It was like, oh, that's like when an editor is basically because it's like. I think like a lot of people and like like I didn't know at the time, a lot of people don't really know what an editor does. Um, it's like they think that you're just fixing grammar or, or whatever. Um, and it's like um, so. Uh, so, you know, when I was in the workshops, uh, it's like I discovered the that that I had some affinity uh, for, uh, you know, actually working with pros and making pros better and, and making, you know, um, plot suggestions, all the kind of that kind of editing. Um, but then. Uh, then uh, eventually I realized like, oh, like an editor's who decide, that's right, an editor's who decides what goes into a magazine or what book gets published. And so, you know, those two um, sort of threads of my life sort of intertwined at that point. Yeah, I think of editing as like professional liking. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, like we look for things we like. And yeah. I, I think as we get better at editing, we uh, we get better at figuring out what we like and we get better at articulating it especially yeah. to like our colleagues. Um, when did you start playing D and D? Were you real young or was that sort uh, of mid yeah. too? Yeah, no, I was, uh, I think I was probably 13 when I first played at all. I can't remember exactly when I got into a regular game. Um, it was probably, I was probably like 15 when I got into a regular game. Like when I first started playing, it's like, um, you know, uh, like, like a lot of people, I think my first, exposure to it was like i saw it in et you know it's like they play D and et yeah. um uh and I, I, did, I never played it for a while after that but um my um my mom had married a guy like who you know my stepdad who um he he was into D and D, and he ended up running some games. And so, like, I lived with D and D before I a long time before I played it, like many years. Like, cause uh, I was eight when they got married, and then I, you know, I didn't play until I was like thirteen, and then you know, didn't get into a game until later. Um, I was not allowed to play in the in the game with them, with my stepdad and his group and everything, cause like you know, I mean, you know, at the time it seemed it seemed really mean but in retrospect it's like okay i understand like you don't want a kid playing with you you know but um if you're a bunch of adults but uh still um yeah my yeah. dad brought home the uh the magenta box the basic D D. oh when i was like eight years old too and I oh, just i'm wearing my D D shirt at. today you can't really see it um oh, we yeah, I've got my I've got my blur on the on the background, so it's hard to hard to show it off. But <laughs> speaking of <laughs> speaking of boxes, uh, I've got the the red box shirt on. Well, it was just sort of mysterious. Like I opened the box, and the pictures were awesome, right? Yeah. And then there's these little these little blue die, right? Mm -hmm. That you can't see the numbers on. I mean, <laughs> you're supposed to like draw on them with like a white crayon or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like why can't you guys put numbers on? <laughs> the die? But, right. Uh, yeah, and then I, I think I just started making up uh, how to play like with myself before I ever uh -huh. found other friends in like middle school years later who could be right. into playing this sort of thing. Were you the dungeon master, or were you uh, were you a player mostly? A uh, player mostly, yeah, because like I said, uh, um, you know, I found my my one experience uh, when I decided to try DMing, it was I found it too stressful, so I turned to writing instead. Um, <laughs> but um, which, you know, was a good move for my life overall, because if I had been satisfied by DMing, then, you know, I don't know, if, would I have become an editor? I don't know. Um, but, um, but you know, like in later years, like mostly like the last several years, like I've been playing a lot of D&D &D online with my friends, um, like, you know, who live all over the place. And so we just use like the virtual tabletops, like Roll20 and such. And and you know video chat like Zoom we usually use Discord but um, you know so we can see each other we're talking to each other you know uh, via you know the chat um, and then uh, we can see like a you know a map on on Roll Twenty or whatever and and all that kind of stuff um, but so because because of that and because we're adults uh, it's it's difficult to schedule games but we we got a good team you know of players and it's like we're all like committed it's like okay this day this game is on this day and you know like it's not like we're moving it all around we have scheduled days and we right. keep to our schedule I mean you know um so uh but yeah because I've been so just like sort of obsessed with it for the last several years um uh I uh you know I got into DMing uh, 
you know, more so than I had been in the past. And plus, um, I've started to do some professional stuff with with D and D, um, uh, working with like Cobalt Press, who does third party um, content for D and D, um, and uh, and and Mind and Cook Games as well. Uh, so you know, so that's been that's been pretty cool. I didn't even know that was a thing that you could do as a job back then. Like, I mean, yeah. if I had, I probably would have been pursuing that. But so you are sort of like in a DM perspective then or point of view as you're making all of these uh these games do you make modules or just like uh manuals do you do yeah uh, i mean so what i've done so far is basically um they uh so like kobold has done a couple of adventure anthologies so like uh they're like sort of one shot uh short adventures and so like they'll have like i don't know 10 or 12 uh adventures in one book and then um you know they they hire the people to write them and then and then i'm editing them um so i'm still working as an editor in that way but but it is like being a dm because i'm reading it as a dm would read it and try to make it as good a blueprint for the dm to eventually use to run their game um you know um so and and that's been that's been actually really interesting for me because um because it because um uh, role-playing game stuff is basically always work for hire. Um, so the writers don't have like the copyright. And so like, once they turn it in, it's like, okay, well now it's no longer their sole thing. It's like the, the company that bought it, they can do whatever they want with it. Right. So like when they give it to me, um, I can go ahead and fix things without having to worry about like, Oh, I got to see if the author is okay with this and do all this back and forth stuff. Um, so it, it felt like I could be more, um, uh, have more of a creative contribution to the project. Um, and like, you know, I had like, I have like um, pretty, pretty good flexibility with them, like in terms of like what I'm allowed to do and, and, and change and stuff. So, um, so that's been cool. Um, you know, cause like mostly, you know, like uh, being an editor did satisfy the creative urge that I had that drove me toward that direction. Um, and cause like, I do find it very um, like, I do feel like I'm contributing creatively when I'm doing editing. It's not just that like, Oh, only when I, if, if you were to write a story or something, it's like, well, no, like editing a story and, and putting together magazine stuff. I feel like I, you know, I'm contributing that way and I feel like creative that way. Um, but, uh, but you know, this is different. This is like on a different level where it's like, it, it feels much more, um uh more closer to writing than than uh you know short story editing does um even though you know that also requires a sort of writer brain uh to be applied you know to the stories and does a company like cobalt bring you on to an existing project or do you pitch them or do they uh, have yeah. an idea and you sort of tighten it up how does it work uh yeah no they the, so they um they've been just doing uh they set up all the projects themselves and they figure out what they want to publish. And then they've been um, inviting all of the authors or, or, you know, the game designers to write the, um, write the adventures. Um, and then, so it's like already a finished, it's already like a put together product by the time I get it. Right. So it's like, it, it's not finalized, but it's already like, okay, here's the 12 adventures. You know, th this is what's in the book. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't get an opportunity to say, Oh, look, maybe we should, ditch this one or get somebody else to write this or whatever like it's none of that that's already done um and so i'm just i'm just um sort of tuning it up at that point um so in one way it's like i have more uh uh i'm i'm, I'm contributing more to it creatively but then i have less overall to do with the overall product because it's not like something that i conceived of it's not something that i've shaped in that um sort of uh overarching way um like where you know like i didn't decide who who wrote the the adventures um but uh you know we'll see maybe maybe i will get to do uh something at that level at some point but um you know i'm still fr fairly new at, at doing tabletop role-playing game editing um and it's just kind of a thing i'm doing for fun because i love it and um you know uh, doing it on the side and it's like well maybe maybe it'll maybe it'll build up into something more of a larger um element of my professional life but you know i've got a good thing going with the <laughs> with the fiction i probably not going to throw that aside yeah so you have uh at least five or well not counting the some do you have like 40 some anthologies that you've yeah. edited and then a uh, number of magazines have you ever thought about uh doing something entrepreneurial with rpgs and supplements yeah yeah um there's like a lot of interest in the past 10 right. and 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think like there's only going to be more like you know with after the D and D movie that recently came out that was actually good. Uh, so a lot of people got interested in that. There's all the streams like Critical Role and Dimension Twenty that are getting people interested. And then Baldur's Gate Three just came out, which is an absolutely amazing game. And I have to say, like I was playing it before our our, our interview today, and it's like I it's really hard to step away from it. It's like it's <laughs> it's really enthralling. Um, but um, so I, I mean, it's, just on PC or it, it's on PC and and uh, and consoles. Uh, yeah, it was originally like I mean, there was a little bit of a delay before they got it on consoles, but it's on it's on you know PlayStation Five and yeah, uh, I don't know what the Xbox is called anymore. <laughs> Whatever the X, the recent Xbox is, um, and then PC and and I think Mac too. But um, so it's basically on everything. But um, yeah, I mean, it's an amazing game. Um. It's uh and you know it's based on the fifth edition D and D rules. Uh, they make a lot of changes. Um, you know, not a lot. Well, I mean, a fair number of changes. Uh, you know, to make it work as a video game, some of them seem kind of capriciously decided. Like, it's like what, what? Why? Why? Why did you do that? Like, that's that's so different. Um, you know. Um, and uh, it's like I mean, any any quibbles I have are just quibbles. You know, they're not they're not like major complaints. You know, it's like um, uh. A more reasonable person than I would wouldn't even complain about them, but I'm um you know I get stuck in minutia you know that's that's part of why I'm a good editor you know <laughs> um, so well so you got started editing uh, yeah. around 2001 right that's when you started yeah. the magazine of science fiction and fantasy yeah and how did that uh, were, were you a fan of the magazine before you discovered it I don't I don't remember if they carried it at Walden's when I was <laughs> right. Yeah, they did not carry it at mine. It goes um, way back. It goes back to like the '60s, right? Uh, yeah, 1949 was the first issue. Oh, so perfect. yeah, so yeah, it's a little longer than that. But um, yeah, so yeah, no, my Waldens did not carry it. So it was only that I had only read some stories in like whatever like uh, collections and and anthologies that I had stumbled across. Uh, so I wasn't like you know super well versed in it. Um, I knew that it was one of the big magazines that was publishing well, big contemporary magazines that was publishing science fiction like now or, you know, at the time. Um, whereas like, you know, a lot of them back in the day, like have come and gone and they're no longer around. But like, so there was Asimov's Analog and, and FNSF, uh, which is, you know, that's the shorthand that we use in the industry, FNSF. Um, but um, so, you know, I knew like th those were like the three magazines that I was kind of targeting in my head. It's like, OK, well, you know. Analog and Asimovs are in New York, and then um, turned out FNSF was in New Jersey, and New Jersey was where I had moved to after college um, because my grandparents lived there and they needed help, um, you know, because they were, you know, sort of having some, you know, elderly issues, um, and so I just, and so that was where I was actually born as well, and so I just basically moved back in with them and was taking care of them, and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to use this opportunity to get into publishing, um, which was the only reason I was able to because it was like, um, you know. Publishing salaries uh, when you're just getting started out, like in New York, are usually not very good. And um, and then as it turned out, like when I got the job at FNSF, it was part time. So it was like you combine those things. Look, like, okay, well that's not really something that I could have lived on if I if I didn't have the, the you know sort of grandparent safety net. Um, although I, I paid for it in other ways, you know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if you ever taken care of uh, elderly people. It's like it it can be a lot um and it was a lot for a good portion of it but um you know um you know it helped pave the way for me to be here and, and you know it was good to help them out you know they they'd always been good to me when i was young and stuff so yeah i spent a lot um, of time with my uh elderly grandfather between undergraduate and my master's program mm -hmm. and it was sort of the most uh like the most one-on-one -on -one time really mm -hmm. that i think i'd spent with him uh my grandmother already passed away but like uh, you know, because I was a little bit more grown up at the time, yeah. And uh, and most of the other contexts when I would spend time, it would be like a large family gathering or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, like I could, I could have done that with, I would have had that with my grandfather as well. But unfortunately, he had already had, he already had dementia at the time. So, um, you know, there was, I mean, you could try, but there was only so much you could, you know, really converse with him. Um, but yeah, like every now and then he would sort of uh. Uh, go back in time in his head, I guess, and like yeah. kind of relive some, like, you know, some stuff from the war and things like that. Like, and it's yeah. like stories that I'd never heard before, you know, but, um, but there was very little of that. 
mostly it's like I, I would say he was uh he was sort of powered by cigarettes and coffee. Like he just like <laughs> you know well I think I think it was partly because like he would forget that he had smoked a cigarette just a few minutes ago and so it just it would be like a constant cigarette in his mouth and then same thing with coffee and it's just like he knows he loves cigarettes and coffee and it's just he can't remember <laughs> like how recently he had one you know so just like constant <clears throat> so when you were getting started at uh yeah. uh i'm sorry what's the industry stand uh F fnsf fnsf so you're getting started at fnsf and uh, did you start to feel or notice the way that you were reading did it shift as you started to become like more of a professional editor at the time, like what did you notice as a reader? Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, first of all, it was like quite an eye opening experience when I when like my first day when, uh, you know, so Gordon Van Gelder was the publisher and editor at the time. Uh, he's still the publisher. Um, but, um, you know, he was showing me the ropes. And, and so he just sort of sat down with a bunch of the manuscripts because they were all paper at the time, you know, not before electronic submissions. Um, and so um, he just sat down with them and he had me like sort of observe him going through them. And I was like, I was just like, whoa, wait, it's it that fast? Uh, you, you know, because it's like, I, you know, I always kind of thought that, you know, more reading would happen before an editor make a decision. But then little did, did I know, um, and every editor discovers this, it's like, okay, well, no, you can actually tell really fast whether or not, you know, a, a story has something going for it or or at least um, is a story for you. You know, yeah. I mean, sometimes sometimes you might miss something like if you had powered through, but it's like, well, but the writer also should have uh, gotten that beginning better in order, uh, you know, to match up with the, the the better stuff they have at the end. But, um, you know, short stories is kind of um, it's kind of a buyer's market. And so when you're reading um, for submissions, like whether you're reading slush or you're reading like solicited stuff, it's like, OK, well, um, you know, uh, if something needs like a good amount of work, it's like, well, how much do I love the good parts of this? Yeah. That do I need to put in this extra work? Because it's like, you know, there's not like a ton of money around for any of it, for, 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 for the authors, for the editors, for any, any, any aspect of it, really. Uh, every now and then you, you get lucky and there's a, there's a project where it's like, okay, no, there is some money for this one. But most of the time, you know, there's not a lot. So it's like, okay, well, you know, how much, how much effort am I going to put into this one story? Whereas like, if I just keep reading, I'm going to find stories that are, in much better shape that don't, aren't going to need like hours of work. Um, so, um, so, you know, I mean, all of that stuff was stuff that I learned as I, as I went along. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I mean, I, I certainly, I certainly found myself um, getting to the point where, you know, sometimes I was like, I just wasn't liking anything. And I was like going through like a whole bunch of manuscripts and I was like, I was trying to figure out, how I could test myself like well am I just in a bad mood am I in like a bad headspace to read or is this just a bad run of stories and so I thought uh, I had the thought to like okay well why don't I pick up a story that I know I love and read that now and see how I feel now and it's like okay if I'm reading it and I still like get excited by that then it's like okay well no it's not me it's the story it's just that this is a bad run of stories where it's you know um we haven't had any luck um so for me, like that's like my the thing that I would turn to would be flower, flowers for Algernon, uh, the short story version, not the not the novel version. Um, uh, I mean, the novel version is great too, but it's just like it's just a longer version of a thing that was already perfect. Um, so um, and and actually, uh, FNSF published Flowers for Algernon, so that was super cool. Um, I hadn't read it before I got the job there. High school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I hadn't read it before I worked there, but I mean, once I did work there, like, I mean, I got really into, you know, um, you know, wanting to know everything about the magazine and, and like, you know, eventually I ended up actually, um, acquiring every single issue of it, um, which, you know, going back to 1949, that's a lot of issues. Um, and I still have them. So um, worth a lot of money, aren't they? Not really. No? <laughs> um, no, I mean, um, so, I mean, I got some of that stuff. Say what? I thought there was a collector's market for some of that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, only a little bit. Like, uh, so I was collecting them piecemeal on eBay for a while, and it was like really tedious. I had like a spreadsheet, and I was like trying to track which ones I had and all that. Um, and then um, somebody like so FNSF has classified ads in the back, and um, like just one page of classified ads. And so like somebody like post bought, bought an ad saying that they had like a a a mostly complete run of FNSF 
like I don't know, it was like it was five hundred issues or something at the time. I can't remember. Um, but um and like he he, he only wanted like 500 bucks for it so i was like a dollar an issue that sounds amazing um and he was he was just in um he was in just in brooklyn and we were in new jersey and north new jersey so i was like hell i could i could go drive over there and pick him up because it was like the cost of shipping all of those issues would have been incredible and like 500 bucks was a lot to me at the time you know like i you know i wasn't making yeah. a ton of money as a as an editorial assistant um so uh so yeah i went and i bought them um and uh and yeah um i i eventually i i plugged in whatever few gaps that there were in the collection and so yeah i, ha I have literally every issue um i had these grand plans to like oh i'm gonna read everything and i mean i didn't make a much of a dent yeah, in that sure. unfortunately um it's kind of like acqu acquiring a wine cellar it has yeah to yeah yeah the right vintage or something and then right you pick it up yeah yeah um, well, but the, to, to tell you, uh, how little of a, of a collector's market there is, uh, so, um, I lived in, uh, so I live in Missouri now, but, um, a couple of years ago, I lived in California. Um, and when we were deciding to move here, I was like, oh, well, you know, we have to write, cause we were getting a moving truck and everything. And so I'm like, do we really want to take all of these books and issues and everything like to Missouri too? Cause it's like, I'm mostly reading stuff digitally these days. And it's like, do I really need all that? Um, and so you know, I, uh, I got rid of, a, I got rid of most of my book collection. Um, but then I also had the wow. magazines. And so, um, uh, uh, so there's a, there's a, a center for science fiction, um, in, um, uh, uh, at UCLA, um, uh, or, well, it's University of California, Riverside is where it is. Um, and so, um, they have like a center for science fiction there. And so like, uh, I knew about that. And so I, I reached out to them and I asked them if they wanted to like receive a donation of my collection. Whoa. And so they, they were willing to take it on. Um, and so they like, you know, they got all these boxes of books and everything, but then I was like, Hey, well, I also have a complete run of FNSF. Do you want that? And they're like, nah, you know, nah, we're good. What? They turned <laughs> yeah. <it> down. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I was just going to give it to them. Um, <laughs> but um and then you know once once they passed on it i was like you know and i i did um kind of half-heartedly look around to see if anybody wanted to buy it but then i was like all right well i'm not just gonna throw them away uh, so he's like oh, so i still have them <laughs> but um but yeah I, I was surprised that they didn't want to take them because it was like i mean yeah. a special collection <laughs> that's what you want in the special collection right okay. I mean, <laughs> so I want to think if uh, I'm trying to remember if uh, if Dave talked about did he go there at some point to he may have or maybe one of his yeah. tests did I remember it came up in, in an episode oh yeah yeah I mean it's very possible Dave went there I mean he did go to he did uh, get a master's at UCLA so um, you know he was in that vicinity um, I'm not sure how close Riverside is to where like the main campus of UCLA is but um, uh, but yeah so. Yeah, it's entirely possible. I'm sure he. I'm sure we have mentioned it on Geek Side, but um, just because, uh, you know, that's the kind of show that you would mention that on. Yeah, yeah, I, I would love to check it out. Do they have the papers of several? Is it is it really a collector? Yeah. Or do they have like huge collections of this writer and that writer? Is that where Zelazny is? Or his? No, he's uh, in. Ohio. I uh yeah i'm not entirely sure uh i mean i know zelazny like lived in new mexico i i would have thought that his papers would be in new mexico but i don't know where his papers ended up uh, actually dave would probably know because he zelazny is like his favorite author um i mean yeah. like nine princes and amber is his favorite um book um but um i love yeah, his I'm not... nerd episodes where he brings on these like although yeah is it zelazny i always say yeah. i always since i was a kid said it's zelazny uh, i mean i'm Actually, I'm not actually sure. But I was like ones. eight or ten or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started reading the book, so I'm, yeah. So I mean, that's... I'm not actually, I'm not actually sure which one is right now that we're saying it, but um, <laughs> uh, same with Heinlein. Um, like I always thought it was Heinlein, but it's pronounced Heinlein. So, uh, yeah. But um, but yeah, as far as the collection, I'm not, I'm not really sure what it entails. Like I, I believe they have Octavia Butler's papers yeah. and stuff because well, she was from was. Terry Canavan, I think, was talking about going. Oh yeah. To do work okay. on Octavia Butler's. Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think she lived out in that vicinity, um, and so um, she, uh, so her papers are there, I think. But uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what the extent of it is. And and they also have a big collection of my, <laughs> my uh, research library. Um, but yeah, that's so. What I donated to them was basically, I mean, it was all, it was all short stories, but it was like 
uh, it was something that I had assembled, uh, you know, sort of diligently and piecemeal over the course of several years, um, because I, you know, my first anthology was Wastelands, which was a reprint anthology. So these were stories that all had been published somewhere else first, and I collected them in that one volume. Um, and so because I had done that, and then I had subsequently, you know, gotten the opportunity to do other reprint anthologies, I was like, I was buying anthologies from all over the place because I was like, I was doing research and I was like finding out like, you know, when I, when I, when I have a theme, I'm like, okay, well, I'm doing research to figure out what stories fit that theme. And then it's like, well, I can't find this, this story anywhere else. I got to go, I got to buy a book that has it in it. And so I'm like, you know, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this. Um, and so eventually it, it, it became quite a collection. And so, um, you know, um, many years later uh, it was, it was kind of, very handy to like if i ever like just needed needed to read a specific story because of whatever editorial reason it's like i could go look and see if i have it and there was a very good chance i did have it um but um but yeah so what gave you the idea you're at like fnsf for five yeah. six seven years before you start i think working out yeah. thinking about anthologies yeah what, what gave you the idea and how did you sort of start going about it yeah well, um, so, I mean, one of the first things I sort of uh, saw as an editor when I was reading, so I, I, we, we, so I sort of said, like, we we're, we're going to talk about trends, but, like, I guess the first trend that I saw was in the slush pile at FNSF, which was uh, this resurgence of post-apocalyptic fiction. Hmm. Um, now, that kind of, that genre, or that subgenre had been sort of out of fashion for many years, like, basically since the Cold War um, had ended. Um, and it was like really big in the 50s, all the way up until, you know, the Cold War ended. But then when it ended, nobody was writing it anymore. Um, but then so I had noticed this resurgence and, and it had always been a favorite uh, sub subgenre of mine. Like I loved the Fallout games uh, from, you know, from back in the day. And, uh, you know, and then <laughs> later, later after that as well, the when the newer, newer ones came out. Um, but um uh, but you know, like I, I had, I had a love for post-apocalyptic fiction for a long time, and so um, I had noticed that trend, and I sort of had attributed it to 9/11, um, you know, because it's like suddenly people were feeling this anxiety of like it feels like the world could end um, again, like like it did during the Cold War, um, and so um, so I'd seen all these people writing about that, and so uh, you know. I, I just sort of thought it was interesting for a while. And then eventually, um, as I worked there for several years, uh, I started doing some freelance uh, stuff on the side, which Gordon had always encouraged. Um, <clears throat> so I started doing interviews and reviews and things like that. And um, there was a magazine that very short lived called 3SF. Uh, it was a British magazine and they had a, a column called Subgenre Spotlight. Um, is that what it was called? I can't remember if that's what it was called or that's what we called it later when we uh, sort of published it somewhere. Maybe that. So I, I had published something with them and then they went out of print and then they ceased publication. And then the Internet Review of Science Fiction picked up uh, what I had been doing for them and published it there. So I can't remember which one was called Subgenre Spotlight. One of them was. Anyway, uh, you know, the idea was like, here's a reading list for this subgenre. And so I'd seen they had done that for something else. And so I pitched them post-apocalyptic fiction. Um, and so I did all that research for that. Um, and so it got published and that was like my first, I think that was my first, um, was it my first? I don't know. It was one of my first like nonfiction articles uh, that I published. Um, and so um, because I'd done all that research, like, you know, um, I actually had started assembling the, my research library because of that, because like I was like, OK, well, I need to do some of this reading to make sure that I, if I'm going to recommend this, put this on the list. Like, I, you know, I want to make sure that this is uh, legit. Um, and it's like it, it's, it's actually a ridiculous amount of research to do that one article that I got paid like very little for, you know, <laughs> um, but it did it did end up paying off in the end because it led to my first anthology. Um, but um, but yeah, so, you know, it. Uh, uh, you know, so I did that. And then, um, you know, I started uh, doing other kind of freelance things. And, um, you know, sorry, I kind of got lost to where the question started. Well, pretty soon after that, a uh, year or two after Wasteland, uh, you're yeah. at Lightspeed, right? Is it 20 yeah. 2011 when you started at Lightspeed? Uh, yeah, no, 2010. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Wastelands came out in 2008, and then uh, it was very successful, um, surprising everyone, including me um, and the publisher. Um, and it, did, it just did very well out of the gates. And um, so it kind of 
paved the way for everything that I did that that I've done that came after. Um, and um, so I did that. And then um, The Living Dead, uh, which was a zombie anthology that came out actually the same year. And then it did even better than Wastelands. Um, and so the combination of those two things is like, OK, like suddenly, like now I'm I'm an editor on the rise. And, you know, so um, and Nightshade Books loved me and we were doing all these books together. Um, and that eventually they eventually had financial difficulties and it was very tumultuous for a while. They ended up selling selling their company to Skyhorse Books. And so they still kind of exist, but it's a totally different company now, just with the same name and the back backlist. You know, uh, none of the people are still there. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, I, uh, I did those and then, uh, I did a couple of anthologies in 2009 and then, um, you know, um, I got the opportunity to do Lightspeed, uh, around then and, you know, eventually, uh, launched it in 2010. Uh, but the second book that I did was called Seeds of Change and it was just this little, little anthology. It was only 40,000 words. Uh, so, you know, like sort of less than half the size of like a normal, like anthology or novel. Um, and, uh. You know, uh, so Prime Books had published it, and Sean Wallace ran that. Um, and he just sort of approached me about it after seeing the success of Wastelands. He was like, "Hey, let's let's try to do this." And um, so um, I had a lot of fun with it because it was all original. Um, and you know, previously, you know, Wastelands was reprint, so I was like, "Hey, I, it was really cool to work with uh, original stories." Um, and um, you know, it was a book that. Uh, it did well enough for the publisher. It wasn't ever going to make any sales records. You know, it's like it was a very small scale book, uh, but it looked really cool. It was, uh, you know, it, it, it did well. Um, a story we published in there got reprinted in Gardner Dozois' Year's Best Anthology. So so that was cool. Um, but then just the fact that just based on uh, how Seed to Change turned out, I think that got Sean thinking, um, you know, maybe I could edit a magazine because he was already publishing fantasy magazine. Um, and I think he, and, you know, so he was sort of thinking like, oh, maybe this is a way for us to do a science fiction magazine. We can get, you know, me to edit it. Um, and so he started talking to me about it and eventually it, it became Lightspeed. Um, or sure so he, before Lightspeed. Became so, Lightspeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, I was right there on the founding of it. So it was like, so, um, so Sean just sort of approached me about doing it. So he was the original publisher um, and I was the original editor. Um, and so uh, sort of uh, it was like largely my vision, but with him sort of supporting um, from the, uh, you know, the financial side. I mean, he, you know, he contributed ideas as well. So I mean, it wasn't just all me, but, um, you know, together we put out, um, you know, put together uh, Lightspeed. Um, and so he published it for like about a year or something like that. And then or about a year and a half. And then in 2011, this is maybe, maybe where you got 2011 from. Um, uh, that's when I bought the magazine and I became the publisher as well. So, um, because like, I don't know, Sean just decided that he was going to focus on his books and he was going to try to get out of magazines. And so he sold me, uh, Lightspeed. Um, and, uh, and actually by that time I'd also taken over editing fantasy magazine. And so he sold me both of them. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so like at that time, I actually, when I bought them, I merged fantasy into Lightspeed. And so, Lightspeed used to be just a science fiction magazine, but then once I did that, it became a science fiction and fantasy magazine. Uh, so basically, it was like a new FNSF, <laughs> so which was what I wanted to edit all along. Um, but um, but you know, so um, so that's how that came about. And uh, uh, you know, fantasy has has had this weird life cycle because it was like it was a magazine for a long while before I came around. Then I started editing it, and then I ended up buying it. I merged it into Lightspeed. Uh, when we did some special issues several years later, we did we brought fantasy back and we did special issues of that as well because we did it for all three magazines um, and uh, well, all three genres. We so we um, so we did the we did this um, you know destroy uh, destroy special issue series where um, so the first one was called Women Destroy Science Fiction yeah. uh, because. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, uh, uh, some people had been, so, so there was this, like, review that was complaining about, um, I think it was a Lois McMaster Bujold novel, um, and, and was kind of criticizing it for having too much, like, uh, like, girl cooties in it, basically, you know, like, oh, there's <laughs> romance, oh, there's this, that, whatever, and, like, the reviewer just made such a ridiculous think about it, and, um, and said something just like really inflammatory, like very derogatory towards women and women writers. And so, you know, uh, the internet being what it is at that time, you know, um, 
you know, with Twitter and everything, it's like that blew up into a thing. Like that was like a major ripple in the genre in our little tide pool. Like most people wouldn't have noticed it, but we noticed it. And it was like, it was like a thing. Um, and so, um, you know, and my wife was one of the ones who was like sort of like, um, you know, yelling about it on Twitter. And um, so we started talking and we decided to do this a special issue. Um, and so the special issue was going to be just uh, all women writers. Um, and so we did a Kickstarter and it was very successful. And so, uh, you know, Kickstarter has always has stretch goals. So we did uh, so we did the special issue for Lightspeed of all, have it be all science fiction. And then we did Nightmare so women destroy horror and then we did women destroy fantasy as well um and so that's why fantasy came back to life for the special issues um we did two other uh special issue series so we did queers destroy and then people of color destroy as well and we you know again had the, the three issues um and then fantasy has sort of been uh, on hiatus until then um in, until a couple of years ago uh, we revived it and then uh my wife uh, with my wife at the helm um well, well her and uh, arlie sork were editing it together um it started with us talking about it and then she decided uh she wanted to co-edit with arlie and so the two of them together uh edited it for the last several years um we just brought that running. yeah sorry it's still up and running uh well yeah i mean actually okay. uh so october this october issue was the last the last issue of fantasy um because uh so um i don't know if you uh have heard about uh what amazon's been doing but you know they have a their kindle periodicals program uh, uh you know basically all of the magazines in the in our genre has have been surviving based on that because it's like you know amazon is just you know that's just where people go to buy their their ebooks and stuff it's like and it's like nothing else has very much market share and so if you're not selling there if you're not selling well there then you're not selling well um, and so they have one of they have basically the only um, major brands that has a subscription option for ebook magazines. Um, and so they had their system for several years and we were using it and, um, you know, it was very reliable. Um, but then they decided that they were going to kill that program and shift everything into Kindle Unlimited. Um, and so it's kind of still there, but uh, because they can do whatever they want, um, you know, they decided, okay, so what, how it's going to work now is that they're going to offer um, a certain fee uh, that is not based on, you know, number of reads and things. So it's like a flat fee. And then it's like, okay, well, I can see how much money I would have made if I just kept my subscribers. And then I see how much money they're offering me now. And it's like, okay, well, these two things are not equal. Yeah. Um, and so because of this change, um, you know, a lot of magazines are like kind of like panicking and stuff. And so like we, and we were sort of and we just had to take a hard look at fantasy and it's like well it's been three years um it hasn't it hasn't um it's gotten some it's gotten some good accolades and they published a lot of good fiction and they've had a, a a fan base but unfortunately um there haven't been enough people who had actually tried to support it financially so like you know people weren't subscribing and, and doing that kind of stuff um and there were various other metrics that went into it but it just it just seemed unsustainable given the new um the new reality of, 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 uh, you know, the sort of Amazon landscape. Um, so, cause it's like, you know, we don't, we don't want to risk like light speed and nightmare, um, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting dragged down because, uh, you know, fantasy, uh, isn't selling enough. And then all three magazines end up having to go out of print or, out, uh, you know, go away. Um, so, uh, you know, well, so it was, it was tough, but you know, Sorry. Like when you moved from editing into yeah. uh, running the magazines, yeah. what were some of the big sort of mental shifts for you? Yeah. Or like, what did you discover about the marketplace that maybe you weren't aware yeah. of before mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I was kind of bumbling along the whole time, which is, I think is what a lot of people do who run magazines uh, for the first time. You know, I mean, I never wanted to be a publisher, um, you know, and so... Uh, Let's see. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I ever did learn anything. That's probably why the magazine isn't bigger than it is. You know, I mean, it's like I, I'm not a, I'm not a business person um, and really a publisher probably should be a business person. So I don't know if I was really the ideal person for that. But, um, you know, um, I mean, I kept I kept the lights on, you know, I mean, I got the mag. I got I you know, we got a lot of good um you know, uh, we published a lot of good stories over the years and got, uh, you know, some good acclaim and stuff like that. So I've been happy with that. Um, and, you know, I've seen 
uh, subscription numbers grow and website numbers grow and stuff like that. So it's like, I've been generally happy with that stuff. Um, I couldn't, I uh, like as much as I, as much as I, I struggle to talk about publishing trends, like if you're going to, if you're going to ask me a business question, like I'm not going to, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, <laughs> if I, if I, if I understood business, I wouldn't be running a magazine. You know what I mean? Um, so, uh, <laughs> Well, was that was that how it worked in the beginning? It was just passion forward. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hard work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was um, it was basically a hobby um, that I was just. It was a very all-consuming hobby that I just paid a lot of attention to. Um, and you know, I at the time I was, um, I think yeah, right yeah, around then like I was already working. I was already working from home full time. Like I had um, you know, so when I when I um, started Lightspeed, I, I left FNSF obviously. Um, and, um, you know, at the time I was, I was doing so many, so much like nonfiction stuff that, um, that, uh, I didn't, I didn't need to, uh, actually keep, uh, or like have another job as well as doing all of my other editing things. So, you know, I was, I was doing, I was working on my anthologies, I was launching Lightspeed. So it was a good time where I could, uh, devote a lot of time, an, an undue amount of time to Lightspeed for given the fact that it's like, you know, it's not really, um, <laughs> not really bringing in anything very much at, at first, you know, um, now it, now it, now it does okay, you know, but, um, yeah, you know, it's first it, year though. Like I was looking at uh, yeah. out the uh, very handsome first year collection, mm -hmm. and uh, Stephen King is in here. Orson yeah. Scott Card, Ursula K. Le Guin, George R.R. Yeah. R. Martin. Yeah. Uh, who else was on here? Yeah. Bruce Sterling was one of my actually was I think the first writer that oh, I remember yeah. that I discovered at FNSF. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A story called uh, Oh no, I'm not going to remember. The Littlest Jackal. It's about oh, like okay. a children's book writer, and it okay. just, it struck me with its because it was definitely uh, now I don't even remember the plot, but it was definitely fantastic uh, or had sci-fi elements, but it was so realistic at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it really captured my attention. Yeah, um, yeah actually, uh, Bruce Sterling. Um, so uh, when I was in college, uh, I happened to. Um, uh, luckily find a, a, a science fiction literature course offered. Um, and uh, so when we were, when I was in that class, um, one of the, one of the, so we had like a, a, a classic anthology of science fiction that we used as like a main text. And then he also, the, the, the professor also had us read uh, Dwayne Droid's Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. And then he, ha he picked a, a more contemporary book uh, of short stories, which he, he used uh, one of Bruce Sterling's collections. I think it was a good old fashioned future. Um, I'm not entirely sure if that's the one, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Um, and then the the classic anthology that we used was uh, The Road to Science Fiction, Volume 3, From Heinlein to Here, uh, by James uh, James Gunn. Um, there's a lot of great stories in there. Um, but, um, but yeah, so. But did Lightspeed have a lot of financial support in that first year? Or was the uh, marketplace or the writers or the way that rights worked back then? Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe even now like how difficult is it to acquire because yeah. some of those were reprints right yeah 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 so and yeah so like yeah so lightspeed um until just very recently we'd always been sort of half reprint half original fiction and so original fiction you would pay a certain rate for and then the reprint fiction would be a much reduced rate uh, compared to that and so like I think at the time it was really only one cent a word for reprints so like you know you could get a reprint for like 50 bucks basically um, I mean it depends on who it is but I mean for most authors that's what it would be um, I think for Stephen King I probably paid more than that but I mean not like a not like a significant amount more based on like who he is you know it's like he was always very reasonable about um, about these kinds of things um, but um, make more <laughs> sorry he'll make more you guys yeah, 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 off. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, it's like people who are um, sort of precious about like allowing reprints of their stories or things or, or like they, they, they try to charge an arm and a leg for them. It's like, well, I mean, that's just that that's bad for your business. I mean, like, what's the difference? Like, let anybody who wants to reprint a thing, reprint the thing. I mean, unless you think it's going to be in bad company. Like if you, if you think it's going to, if, if you think the books looks fine and you're going to be in, uh, if you're going to be reprinted alongside X, Y, and Z, and it's like, those are all people you'd like to be next to. Like, 
don't don't make a big stink about like the about how much money you're. I mean, the money is going to be very small regardless. Like you're not going to get like thousands of dollars for like a reprint of a story. But if you if you're in all these different books and your stories are uh, kept alive by these reprints, new generations are going to discover your work. They're going to discover that story. Um, you know, people read anthologies kind of like as a sampler sometimes, you know, like they pick it up because there's a George R. R. Martin story in it or whatever. Then they read all the other things, all their other stories, and then they're like, oh, well, now they discovered a bunch of new authors that they actually really love. Um, and they look for their, their work. Um, but yeah, so it's like, um, you know, I, I always appreciate like authors who are just like, you know, you ask them if you can reprint something and they're just like, yeah, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> you know, because it's like, what, there's no, <laughs> given given that negotiating price isn't really super relevant in that kind of endeavor because there's just going to be so little money anyway. I mean, just 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 get those stories out there. Um, you know, don't keep them in a treasure vault, like, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, and the thing is, it's like, so I always appreciate Stephen King would, um let his stories out there because like he he could very easily keep them in just in his collections and you know he wouldn't suffer from that you know um so uh so yeah you know I sorry. Think in his mind, he's building the culture of not yeah. just, like there's the readership culture but also the publishership culture. yeah and uh if i would guess i would think that stephen king would be a passionate supporter of oh yeah you know that yeah that and I tend to think that, like, as writers' careers go, they're not really built on dollars and money. They're built on, like, a re like developing a readership, developing, becoming visible. I yeah. think for readers, um, and yeah, just getting your stuff out there for whatever little bit, yeah. I think helps. And hopefully, at some point, it can become, you know, yeah. a means of support. Yeah, that's not why any of us get into uh, the writing game. We're gonna get rich, I, or I've never right. been such a writer. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, people like if you know if you're writing novels and stuff like, like you, at least you might have some hopes and dreams of it. Like you might think like, oh, like this is my lottery ticket, and it's like, well, maybe it'll pan out, but probably it won't. You know. Um. So you know, with, with short stories, it's like it's such a slim like chance that anything will ever happen that will be significant with a short story. But you know, sometimes it does. Hey, it worked out pretty well for like people like Ted Chang, you know, I mean, like, oh, yeah. you know, uh, like Arrival is based on a short story, you know, so like that worked out pretty well. Um, and then there's other people who like have managed to make a live like a career out of just short stories, like like Kelly Link also is another person. Um, and like back in the day it was more common, but like uh, but in present in the, you know, sort of last two decades or so it's like it's basically unheard of that anybody would have a publishing career and be known uh like outside of just the our little genre circle um uh with only short stories but like ted chang and, and kelly link both have have you know broken out of that uh you know publishing from inside the genre instead of like from the literary side using genre elements like uh, people who do that actually seem to have a much easier time of getting books out there and subsisting on just short stories. Um, like Karen Russell uh, lasted a long time uh, just writing short stories before she eventually wrote a novel. Um, and, you know, she was the kind of writer where, like, I, I don't know if she will write a novel. Maybe she will. But, you know, it's like if she can make this work and she seems like she loves short stories, I mean, you know, like more power to her. Um, but, you know, but people who people who start on the literary side of fiction um, and like just incorporate genre elements into it seem to have, uh, you know, better luck doing that. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, um, but what we we're saying about Stephen King and like, you know, stories like letting stories be reprinted and stuff, I I think some of that is like, um, you know, uh, these these more famous writers, like it's kind of like paying it forward. Like yeah. so because it's like it's not it's not uh, it's not for me. It's for the other authors that are in that book. And so like if if, if you know, if George R. R. Martin lets a story be reprinted in in whatever anthology, it's like, OK, well, his name is going to lift up all of those other names that are in the book because people are going to notice it because of his name. Um, and he's aware of that. And he I think he's, you know, like people people who who are uh, that notable, who, who you know, allow their stories to appear in such books. It's like, you know, that's that's part of their their calculus, uh, including like if you try to get him to write an original story for a book and it's like, you know, you're, you're offering them some, you know, paltry amount that is not worth their time based on how much they would get if they just sold a novel or, or worked on a novel. But it's like, you know, 
but you know they still like short stories they want to support short stories they want to support these other writers and be part of that so um you know how does some of the work in other media uh beginning with light speed and then maybe moving into a geek's guide yeah uh, do you think contribute to maybe even the readership of uh, a magazine like Lightspeed, maybe the uh, anthologies that you've been working on, and then maybe eventually uh, the uh, the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy series. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean like how do the readerships and, and, and audiences cross over to each other? Well, maybe like where did you get the idea initially to at Lightspeed, oh. you oh. were publishing the audio stories. And, yeah. and then, yeah, I'm sort of interested in how you and Dave met mm -hmm. and how the idea popped up to oh, okay. a podcast and then it sort of moved around i think from mm -hmm. four to someplace else yeah at wired yeah 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 um yeah so um so let's say well okay so well dave and i first met at um there was a so the science fiction writers of america which is like the science fiction sort of uh writing um sort of uh uh like guild kind of thing um it's um uh, they they have they they used to have a, a an event that that was held in New York every year called the the um like what, what they officially call it I can't remember what they officially called it but colloquially people called it the Mill and Swill um, <laughs> because people would people would go there and like they it was you know there's a lot of alcohol around there but it was basically like, just like a like a cocktail party you know um, and but it was all science fiction fantasy writers editors publishers um, that was partly why it was in New York because it's just like you know all the editors and publishers are basically in New York. And so uh, the writers can come to New York and meet all of these different people and make connections and stuff. Um, and so I went to one of those. Um, I, I, I would used to just like sort of tag along with Gordon when he would go to some event, like he would know all of the different things. And it was like, I was always kind of shy uh, early on um, uh, and because like I didn't really know anybody. And so I was just like tag along, tag along with Gordon. And so uh, but at the mill as well, it was so crazy that it was like I couldn't like I lost them, you know. And so I'm kind of standing in the corner and like Dave came up to me because I'm like, you know, we were about the same age. Um, and, he, you know, he just we just hit it off. Um, and uh, um, so we became friends at five or a little later. Sorry. Say again. Was that around 2005 or a little bit later? Uh, yeah, it's somewhere around then. I, we were trying to pinpoint when exactly it was, and I don't, I can't remember if we actually did, because uh, uh, he just got married recently, and I, I gave his best man speech, and so we were trying to like figure out some of these details, and um, I can't remember if we did or not, but it, it's somewhere in that vicinity. Um, and so, uh, so we became friends. We used to go like uh, he lived in uh, Westchester. Um, in that area and so like he would have to commute into new york city in order to you know to do to do anything in the city and then but i lived in new jersey and so i you know um it was it was like a good trip for each of us to get into the city but we could converge in new york and then kind of go there and hang out um and then we had a friend who had a, a nice apartment um sort of in the upper uh, uh um in the sort of um the east village uh the East Village? I don't know. One of them down there. I, it's so long ago now. Um, it was a ni nicely located spot. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, he would let us like hang out at his, his apartment and stuff. And so like we had like a base of operations. And so like we had we we developed what we called our, our geek posse. Um, and nice. we had like a, you know, a core group of people that we would hang out with and stuff. Um, but uh, so we were hanging out all one day at, at our friend. Uh, his name's Rob. Uh, we were hanging out at Rob's apartment. Um, and uh, Morgan Spurlock had just done his, uh, or there was, I don't know if it was out yet, but uh, he, you know, he had done his documentary about uh, Comic Con, mm -hmm. um, and uh, like I was really excited about that idea, and like so I was sort of talking about like, oh, like you know, maybe we could do, um, maybe we could do like a documentary about like science fiction conventions, because uh, I, th I thought that would be really interesting, um, and because like because uh, Rob, what's that? Still would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, 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 the reason it kind of occurred to me is because Rob was uh, he he'd been doing some indie film stuff and like so like he he was working with somebody who was like he he was help, helping produce this indie film with with a with a, a, a like a longtime friend of his, um, and so like I knew he had some knowledge of that part of things which I had none, you know. But so because I was like okay, so Rob knows about that stuff and then we know about this stuff and um, so we were talking about it, but then Dave was like, well. I don't know. I really like that idea, but like, I don't know, maybe we could do a podcast. Uh, and so that's just kind of how Geek's Guide came about is uh, 
started off with a ridiculous idea of, of, of a bunch of people who don't have any uh, knowledge about how to make a documentary, making a documentary. Um, probably just as well that we, uh, I mean, to be fair, we didn't know how to make a podcast either, but um, we figured it out. Um, so, uh, like 10 then, right? Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. So launched, yeah, launched the same year as Lightspeed. So yeah, that launched in like January 2010, and then Lightspeed launched in June. Um, and uh, like you said, uh, uh, you know, started off on Tor.com. Eventually, Tor.com. Um, I don't know. They, you know, they were they were constantly like changing, um, you know, what their focus was and stuff. And so they decided to. They weren't into doing having a podcast at that time. They decided, and so. Um, so they, they, they sort of canceled us there. Um, and so I had some connections that I own. Like, what is the overhead to, yeah, I don't know. Podcast? I don't get it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, we weren't make we weren't getting paid very much money for it. So I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why they decided that, but, um, but I had some connections at io9, so I reached out to them and and you know said, hey, would you guys be interested in picking this up? And so they were, and so I lived there for a long time. Um, and then basically the same thing happened, <laughs> you know, where it's like somebody decided somewhere like, hey, hey we got to evaluate whatever, whatever, and, and maybe we should cut that. And, but again, it was like it was very little money, so I don't know why why it would. I just think um, it's a great idea, especially for because yeah. io Nine's a magazine, right? Yeah. Well, I, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Factor readership, and I think yeah. having multiple media like yeah. the platform only invites and grows yeah. the readership. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what ev that's what they both thought at the time, and then they I don't know they decided it wasn't working, um, and then so but then eventually we ended up at Wired uh, or Wired dot com, um, and and it's been there for a really long time, um, and. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, so yeah, I mean, it, it's it's nice that it's had this nice stable home for a long time, and um, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's nice that it's continued. Um, you know, I you know I was the co-host with Dave for the first hundred episodes. Um, and then at that point, um, that's when sort of Best American was starting to get going, and I was just getting really busy with other things. I I can't remember if may it may have also coincided with me getting my novel in print but i i just got very busy around that time and so i was like i i can't really commit to doing this every episode anymore um and so i i stepped down from being the full-time co-host and um it was always more dave's show anyway just because he kind of picked up the ball and ran with it the most you know like he learned how to do all of the audio editing like i know how to edit fiction i don't know how to edit audio like that's a whole other game like they shouldn't even use the same word editing because it's two totally different skills like you know um does not cross over um but um you know, so he had learned how to do all that. Um, he was, you know, doing all this crazy amount of research into every guest and everything. And, and just like, he was like super into it. And so I was like, well, I was never going to be into it at that level because I was doing all these other things. Um, so it was always very much more his show. And so it just made, it made sense for him to be the one that to, to, to keep the torch, to carry the torch forward uh, after I was stepping back. Um, and, you know, I still appear on the show every now and then, like, you know, when there's some TV show or whatever I want to talk about or whatever, whatever it is. Um, when I have a new book out, you know, I go on and, and do an episode. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's nice. I mean, I'm still a producer. So, I mean, I still consult with Dave about, you know, episodes and things like that. But it's just, uh, you know, very much more of a backseat than what it used to be. Yeah, um, it's such a great podcast. It's one of, yeah. you know, two or three that I've listened to for years and years. And oh, years. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, Geek's Guide. Uh, I think I, I the gateway drug was Mark Maron's podcast. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and lately it's between Geek's Guide and this other podcast called Weird Studies. Have you ever heard it? Okay. Uh, I have not heard that one. Oh, man. It's it's pretty amazing. Oh, cool. So those are my two when I'm like running or something and I want to put something in my ears while I'm yeah, yeah. out and about. But yeah, right. great podcast. And it, so right around that time then, uh, you probably would have been pitching uh, for the new, for the Best American series. And that mm -hmm. took a few years. Was yeah. Joe Hill from the beginning as you're pitching it? Uh, no, we, we didn't have anybody attached when we were pitching it. It was just the concept um, because it was like, well, we don't want to, we don't want to try to recruit somebody before we even know if this is a thing that's going to happen. Um, so we just were pitching the the concept because it was like, well, we couldn't really pitch this to other people we could only pitch it to uh houghton mifflin harcourt who was the publisher at the time uh it's now at harper collins because they bought houghton mifflin harcourt um but um 
but yeah, so we were just pitching it to them. And um, so my, my agent at the time was Joe Monty and uh, uh, you know, we sort of conceived of this together. Like he had sort of asked me if I was interested in doing a year's best. And I think it was his idea to pitch it to best American. I can't, I can't remember exactly. Um, but I know we sort of cooked it up together. And so, um, and when I wrote, when I sat down to write the proposal for it, it was like, it was like, I felt like it was the best thing I'd ever written. Cause it was like, it was like, it was like a manifesto basically uh, in support of uh, science fiction fantasy being, uh, you know, as good as any other kind of fiction and damn it, this is going to prove it, you know, like, and, you know, um, I was just very happy with it. Um, and so, you know, they said no the first time. Um, and then we pitched it again. Like, I think, I don't know, it was a year or two later and they said no again. Um, and then um, I can't remember if Joe pitched it just twice or if it was three times, but then um, Joe retired from agency. He got a, you know, he, he's, he's the editor at Saga Press now. So he, he stepped back into editing. Um, and so I, I switched over to Seth Fishman as my agent. And then the first thing Seth did was he sold, uh, he sold HMH on uh, doing best American science fiction and fantasy. So, um, you know, so that was pretty great. Uh, good, 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 uh, you know, good, good first at bat. Um, but, uh, so that, I mean, that was super exciting when that came around. Um, you know, that was also something like, like being a publisher, that was not really something that I had on my bingo card. Like I wasn't like dreaming of that my whole life. Um, you know, uh, because I mean, especially because like all along as I was like, you know, editing all my different anthologies and editing Lightspeed and stuff, I wasn't like surveying the whole field during that time you know i only really started seriously doing that once i you know sold best american you know and it's like i mean i was a read some stuff but i mean i hadn't been like trying to diligently read every dang thing that i could find because i was like i have all this other stuff that i actually have to read that i need to read you know um but uh but yeah i mean it was very eye-opening um so actually this so this came on the heels of me uh i served as a judge for the national book award in the young readers category uh the year like before that um and um so uh so so i had to read so many books that year for that uh it kind of showed me like what i was capable of in terms of like workload uh um, both for part of that um i'm trying to remember um i think it was like 200 that i had to read but i think there was i think there was more than that but we split them up amongst the panel because mm -hmm. it was like there was five people on the panel and we had like we split it up by like the alphabet like you know, okay so y'all read these these letters y'all read these letters and then like and we you know mixed and matched so like two people would read every book at least and then they would like you know sir well did anybody did you did y'all like this then we'll move it on to the next one and get everybody else to read it you know that kind of stuff so sort of uh, uh so so we did that um but yeah i think i think maybe it was like 500 that we had all together but then 200 is what i actually had to look at um, but I can't remember. It's, it's so long ago now. Um, I used to have a good memory and I don't anymore. <laughs> well, there's so much information that goes into the hard drive, so much data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I need now, to defrag I, this thing. Right. But so that would have been like another big transition or transformation as a reader, as an editor, because when you're running Nightmare and Lightspeed, you're reading everything that comes to Lightspeed and Nightmare. But once you're on Best America, you are reading. Yeah everything yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. like in a year what yeah. is the number how many oh. stories are you reading yeah uh yeah so i stopped counting uh overall just because it was like very tedious to try to keep track of it all but like i think the first year i i i estimated it was like five thousand or something wow. um and so you know i just try to read everything these days i actually have an assistant who helps me with it and so like i um uh you know, I, I got that I got that started once I was, uh, you know, getting into the weeds with my novel imprint and getting very busy with that. But then and since that ended, I just kept them on. But, um, you know, it, um, you know, it's just there's a lot of there's a lot of magazines where it's like I've looked at them before. I feel like it's unlikely that I'm going to actually really like much that's in there just because, you know, my my taste doesn't line up with that editor or whatever. Um, or sometimes they're just very small. And so it's like, it's just unlikely that there's going to be something that's among the best. Um, you know, uh, it sounds kind of snooty to say it like that, but you know, you gotta, you gotta cut, you gotta draw a line somewhere, you know, well, cause it's like stories when there's that much material, you have yeah, to yeah. Some kind of rubric. Right. 
and so um and so my assistant uh chris tabasco um he uh, uh i just have him like read certain magazines um to to sort of slush them for me um you know and and point out whatever things that he thinks i should look at uh there's some things that i'm going to look at regardless um including things that i have him look at but then some things i'm just going to look at regardless some things i don't make him look at because i'm just like oh no i you know you don't need to read fnsf i'm going to read that you know um and i don't make him read light speed or nightmare or anything like that but um uh i mean i could have him read nightmare now i mean i'm not the editor of that anymore so um it's that's that's like light speed obviously i know but um it actually would be useful to have him read that too but it is, uh, just because it's like well i'm so close to it it's hard for me to tell which ones are the best ones because i like them all um but uh sure. you know enough is enough i i, I he, he reads enough um but uh so so yeah so you know because I because I, I I sort of live in dread of missing out on something really great that that's why I you know in in those first couple of years where I was just like reading everything myself and just trying to find every every short story published anywhere um, and and so now I've sort of offloaded some of that to Chris but um, you know. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm like mostly off social media these days. And so like, but that was one of the ways that I could often find, I could sort of keep track of when books were coming out and, and like new stories were out because people would post about it online or on social media. Um, but uh, yeah, and it's like, cause it's funny, like some, some, some publishers uh, uh, or editors, like it, it's almost like they do an anthology or something. And then it's like, they try to keep it secret. It's like, well, come on, guys. You like you talk about it. Like, you know, could you reach out? Could you reach out to a year's best editor and send them a copy or something? Like, could you be proactive about it? Like, uh, you know, sometimes it's like I have to email people like multiple times just to get a review copy of something, and I'm like, come on, you know. Um, and it's kind of funny actually. Like, as as many years as Best American's been going on, um, like I think we're what we're on, we've done eight volumes now. I think. Uh, so I mean, you know, several years that we've been around, I don't get very many things sent to me you know, without me asking for it. It's oh. like, you know, you know, it, it's like, I have to ask for ev almost everything still. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> like, uh, so, um, yeah. Um, I assume but, you have a back room just filled with stuff yeah. that comes in the mail every day. Yeah. Well, no. So thankfully I have moved mostly to electronic reading only, <laughs> um, for almost everything. Like, it, like it's that basically started with COVID. Cause like people, like I used to get, so many just review copies of books sent to me all the time, like novels I'm never going to have time to read, novels that I didn't ask for and I probably wouldn't ask for, um, you know, just because it's like I was on every review list because it's like, you know, Lightspeed publishes reviews. I used to do book reviews. I used to do interviews. So like I was in every publicity database, you know, and they don't update them as much as they should probably because um, it's like, you know, you, you'll be on the list forever. Um, and but so during COVID, they stopped a lot of that because people weren't able to go in the office and everything. And so um, I kind of like saw that as like a break. So, I was like, OK, I'm just going to try to get away from that altogether and like never go back to it. And so um, I basically whenever I ask for a review copy now, I always ask them, don't put me on a list. I just want this one thing. <laughs> don't send me unsolicited stuff because uh, it's like I, I don't want to deal with it all because um, it's like it's so it's it's like I never thought I would turn up my nose at getting free books. You know, I mean, that's like the dream, man. That's like the dream of back in the day. Uh, but uh, but now it's just like, well, no, I, I want to I want the book. I, if I if I if I want a book, I'm glad to get it for free. But I don't want just random stuff sent to me anymore. You know, it's like I, I you know, <laughs> that doesn't help me. Um, and, and then, you know, so for for best American reading, I, I just always ask for digital stuff because it's like, you know, I don't want to I don't want to deal with all the all the paper. Uh, so. Yeah, I think when I first started editing and publishing, it was just finding the manuscript, like you were talking about earlier. Yeah. You just want your mind to be blown, or you just want to find this most this most exciting, fresh yeah. discovery. And then I got really into production, thinking about like how it becomes the book and what that looks like, yeah. what online content looks like and how it's designed. But now I think about promotion all the time. Like mm -hmm. once we go through all of this process and we're shepherding this work into the world, how do we find a way to introduce it to as many readers as mm -hmm. possible. Has there been some evolution in the way that you think about editing, production, promotion, or do you yeah. think especially differently about promotion now that you have had so many different kinds of projects and so many different sort of formats? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, certainly uh, once I started uh, my novel imprint, like 
being uh, on the inside of that and seeing the seeing it from um, from the inside, uh, you know, um, that certainly changed some of my point of view of like, you know, publicity and all these kinds of things where it's like I got some I saw some ideas that I could try to implement with the magazines. And I I saw some things that I thought would work, but then seemed like they didn't work because we tried it with a, a book or whatever. Um, and um you know, I mean, I think it's it's all kind of it's all kind of for me at least it's still kind of throwing it against the wall and seeing what sticks kind of stuff. Um, you know, uh, these days, like I mean, for for a long time we were very much relying on social media to get the word out for new sto new stories and everything. It's like now Twitter's basically broken. TweetDeck doesn't work anymore. Like we're in this weird transition phase where it's like, well, does, is Twitter even a thing that people still want to use, or or are we moving on to new things? But everyone is not on the new thing yet, and it's very confusing um but uh but yeah so um yeah i don't know I, I i don't i don't know how to how to do it anymore like it used to be like i thought i knew how to how to how to you know get the word out and and get try to get people talking about a story or something but uh these days i don't know how to do it because it's like social media unfortunately it kind of killed all of the other options that we used to have like we used to be able to like have blogs and like do things like that and it's like there was readerships for all these different places like where you could maybe get some some um interest from people but but now it's like but all those things went away um you know when social media came around and then um you know it, it's, it's unfortunate that these things happen like over and over in the in our in our history in every industry it's like oh it's like okay so we had we had a bunch of indie bookstores and we had uh, a bunch of nice uh walden books and beat altons and, and things and then barnes and noble and borders came around and just put them all out of business and then barnes and noble put borders out of business and then now amazon came around and almost put Barnes and Noble out of business, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's like, why, why do we keep doing these things? It's like, uh, um, so, yeah, um, man. yeah, I know, but the consolidator. Yeah. But so. still you're finding ways to publish books and find readers for them. So, yeah. so in the best American series, yeah. Uh, not speaking to trends, but how do you, yeah. how in your mind has either the series evolved uh, since 2015, or maybe how has uh, your approach as an editor evolved in yeah. eight or so years? Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, um, I guess I guess at first I found myself being much more precious about what I considered worthy to be, you know, uh, in there, and I and I put way too much pressure on myself. I think to um, to sort of like read and reread and and you know really hem and haw about every single thing and it's like i gotta trust myself you know it's like i i i only got this job because i've done this for so long and i've you know i've I've achieved a certain amount of success and so you know i got you know i've i've always trusted myself when i'm like buying stories for lightspeed or or you know if i just like you know uh making the decision to publish a story you know like i've, I've never like second guessed myself well i mean not never but I, i'm generally very confident with it like every now and then i want a second opinion about something or whatever but um you know but i found myself really second guessing myself a lot early on i think just because it's like i really wanted this to be uh successful because it was like this is science fiction fantasy's big swing at this best american spotlight you know and never I'm had one what's that an overdue one i think yeah 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 because i mean the best american series has been around for like 100 plus years uh you know there was a mystery one for a long time it still is but i mean for a long time before this one there was an infographics one before they had this one um uh that one has gone away since but um you know yeah it's just like yeah, travel uh, writing essays yeah 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 is there a food so, writing best american there is a food writing yeah that i think that one's newer than than this one but um <clears throat> But yeah, you know, there's all these different things that had had a showcase in the series before science fiction and fantasy, which I always thought was ridiculous because short stories are probably, you know, they're more important to science fiction and fantasy than probably any other genre, uh, probably even more than in literary fiction. I mean, you know, like, I, I don't know, that might, that might be a sort of tie because like, it's, it's pretty important in literary fiction too. But, um, you know, it's like, uh, I, I would, I would say short I'm stories are- leadership. In yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantasy for short stories is my guess. Yeah, well, maybe not. Yeah, but I mean, like you know, it's funny because it's like 
uh, mysteries uh, are, are not very well known for short stories. I mean, it's much more of a novel form. And so it's just kind of funny that that series had been around for a long time before the science fiction fantasy one, because, you know, because we do have this thriving, you know, uh, culture of, of short story publication in, in the in science fiction fantasy. Um, whereas in mysteries, it's like kind of like, well, you don't have enough space in a short story to really tell a full mystery. It's like you can't do all the different like red herrings and things like that. You can't like you can't get all of the mystery part of it because it's too condensed um, no, is, is what I've. Yeah, which, th that's what I've heard. I, I mean, I haven't done the extensive studying in it, but um, but, you know, it uh, anyway, I, I'm just glad that it's here now. Um, you know, at the time, um, you know, the 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 market was more crowded uh, of best of the year anthologies. But then since then, that's contracted. And so uh, so th we're one of the, you know, surviving ones. Um, it's it's pretty sad. Like so Gardner Dozois was like, you know, an amazing editor for a long time. Um, you know, he, he's deceased now. But, um, you know, he uh, edited Asimov Science Fiction for a long time. He had his uh, year's best science fiction which was like the kind of flagship year's best anthology to me um, for science fiction um, in the genre. Um, and uh, so he did it for like, I don't know, 30 years or something. Um, and then um, when he died, they just, they just killed it. I'm like, that seems like such a ridiculous shame to just take all of that history, all of that, that continuity of excellence and just throw it away because that editor is no longer around now. Like, get somebody else to edit it. Like there's plenty of editors that could have stepped into that role and kept up that level of excellence, you know? Um, and so it's just like, it felt like a slap in the face to me to, to just throw it away. Um, and, and the and actually like such, it felt like disrespect to Gardner. Um, because also there was another book that he had been working on. This was going to be an original anthology that I know was mostly done because a lot of the stories uh, have uh, have gone on to be published elsewhere. But when he died, they also just canceled that. This was a different publisher, but this <clears throat> this book was happening. Uh, they had published a couple other anthologies by him, and then when he died, they just like like okay, no, that's canceled now. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, a, it's an institution, and it's like a, it's a service to the community. Yeah. And, uh, to the cultural practice uh, of the writing and the reading. Um, yeah. But in this most recent volume, yeah. there, do you have a favorite story? Because uh, uh, yeah. there's a lot of variety I found in, uh, there's a lot of variety in the yeah. stories, in both the fantasy and the science fiction. And sometimes it's a little hard to tell which is which, but there's yeah. like a, a variety of both. And I wondered, I have a couple that I thought were my favorite, but mm -hmm. I wondered if you had one in particular that had that sort of effect that you were yeah. describing with Alfred Bester, where oh yeah, it felt like a really fresh discovery, really early in the story, and there yeah. was that was maybe kind of easy to articulate, right? What you liked about it and what was so great about it. Yeah. Uh, so just as a quick aside, uh, I actually wanted to put what genre each story was in the book like i wanted it to say science fiction like i have a label in there and they just they just always refused it like i don't, I, I haven't asked in several i haven't oh, yes. asked since the beginning i should i should have maybe asked again because i was just like why why not like just put a label because you know because i'm sick of i'm sick of people on amazon reviewing it and saying it's all fantasy it's like it's literally half science fiction half fantasy every time it's like the the guest editor has to pick 10 of one and 10 of the other like I mean, I'm the one that's saying like this one's science fiction, this one's fantasy, whatever. But it's like, come on, it's like. I think a lot know, of anyway. times it's confusing because like Star Wars, yeah. like my, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, Entree, as a right. kid, before I could read, I was watching Star Wars, right. and so it's a science fiction story. Yeah. because it's a space opera, but it's right. really, it's a fantasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about yeah about the force, right. and yeah. sort of this. Uh, yeah, it's a sort of a, not exactly Arthurian, but it's like it's like a knight's tale. He's yeah. a giant knight, literally. Right. They call it. So yeah. It can be hard to tell because the traffic yeah, yeah, yeah. and the function or whatever sure. is fuzzy. But I think it's an interesting question. Like, how would you or how do you right. distinguish as the. Um, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of like one of those, like, you know, it when you see it kind of things where. Um, it's just it's sometimes it's like you sometimes like you're not even really sure you just have to make a decision like if you if you're in a position where you have to label it as one or the other which 
I don't actually even care about the difference, but I've somehow put myself in this position where in both Lightspeed and in this, <laughs> I'm 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 play, making myself identify which one they are, mm -hmm. um, but so um, you know um, you know most of the time it's pretty clear to me. Sometimes it's like okay, well yeah, there's that like what you're talking about like with Star Wars where it's like well it feels like science fiction, but there's all this stuff in it that's like that seems like it's just magic, you know, um, but um, you know uh, so I I don't know there's no, there's no like science to it like how do you can determine which one is which i mean a lot of people have written um descriptions like it's okay well in science fiction um it's like uh so in, in a fantasy story uh something impossible can happen but in in a science fiction story something uh would be impossible now but theoretically possible would happen and so it's like that's kind of like one of the distinctions but um but you know it's like yeah it's just kind of a gut thing um but uh, but to your to your uh, original question about uh, stories, uh, so this is kind of cheating because this story actually originally appeared in Lightspeed. But uh, but the CRISPR cookbook, uh, a guide to biohacking your own abortion in a post row world, um, by uh, I don't even remember how to say this name, but it's Merkinogold. Gold. <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a. I was going to ask that's... about that. Yeah. So this this author is using a pseudonym just because they um it, you know it's a it's a very uh. It's a very much in your face story uh, in response to, um, you know, uh, to the Roe versus Wade decision, um, you know, where we're, uh, you know, reversing Roe versus Wade. Um, and, um, you know, it just it just felt like fire to me when I was reading it. Like, I just knew immediately, like, I, I as soon as I read it, I was like, you know, couldn't get to my uh, keyboard fast enough to, uh, you know, to, to send the acceptance, you know. Um, and, and like, so I know who the actual author is and like, I've, I've published the person before. And so, um, you know, I was like, are you, are you sure you want to use the pseudonym? And they were just like, you know, um, they, they don't want to have their work, uh, you know, their day job get in any kind of, um, conflict with this. Like if, if a bunch of trolls come after them because, uh, because of the, the, the nature of the story, you know, just because well, abortion, abortion is such a hot button topic that, you know, a story like this, which is like really, uh, coming at, um, you know, coming at the issue with sort of guns blazing, um, it, uh, you could definitely see how, you know, trolls could come out of the woodwork to, um, you know, to, to harass a person. Um, doesn't seem like it happened with this, although maybe that's partly because they use a pseudonym. I don't know. Um, but um, this was a story that I was so excited about when I first bought it for Lightspeed. I was just like, this is like... Could you summarize the... it real quick, just for, for listeners? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, so it's... Um, it's it's a story that's like written in the form of like a manifesto uh that's telling people who uh live in a post row world uh how they can um still uh you know sort of well biohack their bodies in order to uh be able to get that's abortions in the future. so like, yeah it's, so it's in the future yeah changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gotten worse. You know, it's like if these things go on, this is this is what we end up with. Um, but so um, with, with the idea being that it's like it, it would be so hard to, uh, you know, control your your uh, your body in this future uh, that uh, that you would go to these extreme um, uh steps of, of, of biohacking yourself in order to get an, get an abortion. Um, and, and so, but the really interesting thing about it is that it's like, it's all like real science in there. Like, yeah. you know, all of, all of this biologist, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so like all of this stuff that uh, is being talked about, this is all like theoretically possible stuff. And so like, that's part of the thing that made me really excited about it because it was like, um, it was going at the issue like you know head on, but then it also had it was also bringing all these science receipts, you know, um, and it's so like the, um, the the process for biohacking is yeah. that it it actually specifically hacks the immune system, right? Yeah. So it identifies uh, the fetus as foreign tissue, and the immune system right. hacks it. That's how the abortion works. But it also has the side effect of curing or preventing all forms of cancer afterwards. Oh, right, right. Sorry. And I'm like, is that possible? <laughs> could you could you hack your immune system? And probably right. not, because I suppose that would cure cancer. But like, yeah, or or maybe there's some step in the sort of hacking mechanism yeah. that's described in the story that's like only theoretically possible, but like right. 
to do somehow or something like that. But yeah. that's the sort of thing like in a science fiction story mm -hmm. that I latch on to. And I'm like, is this theoretically possible in some kind of future, like some piece right. of this? And that's right. compelling, right? Yeah. Um, but and so like this story, when I published it in Lightspeed, I, you know, I was just so excited about it. I couldn't wait to get it out there. I like I published it really fast because it was like, you know, I think the row versus Wade decision yeah. was in like July and we published it in September. And I was like, I was trying to get it out in the August issue because I was like, I just wanted it out there right away, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, so but I thought like I thought it was going to gonna like be the talk of the town you know like i thought like everyone's gonna be super excited about it and then so we published it and it's like barely anybody really like talked about it or anything like it didn't it didn't seem like it made waves um and so i was just really disappointed because i thought it was amazing um and uh so like when when we were doing this volume i, I so that i i was very excited that uh, that rebecca um decided to pick it for uh publication in here um because it was like you know I thought it was so great and I felt like everybody had just sort of missed it. Um, and so I was glad to see it actually get some accolades here in, uh, you know, getting chosen for this. Um, and there's a but, similar story too in, there's a second story yeah. that takes on abortion called yeah. uh, Rabbit Test. But yeah. You had it, an amazing called Uncanny that I, yeah. is it an online magazine or a print magazine? Yeah, it's online. Uh, yeah, Uncanny is, uh, so, um, uh, it's very similar to Lightspeed in the sense that it, it publishes similar kinds of stories. Uh, they publish both science fiction and fantasy. Um, but so the editor, uh, well, the editors are uh, are Lynn and Michael Thomas. Um, and but Lynn Thomas, she edited uh, Apex magazine for a while, which is another sort of digital magazine in the field. Um, and uh, once she stopped editing that, then she and Michael ended up launching Uncanny. So you know, she's had some, um, you know. She had prior experience doing Apex, and then they launched Uncanny, and Uncanny sort of has, you know, become uh, even a bigger thing than Apex was. And um, yeah, like they they get they get nominated for awards all the time and stuff um, these these last uh, many years. So they're clearly doing something right. But um, yeah, and they they always have a bunch of stories that I have under consideration and or um, you know on the actual top eighty list for for best American. And. Like when you moved from uh, all the editorial work at Nightmare and Lightspeed into the position of the series editor at Best American, was it startling at all how large the uh, SFF community or landscape really is once you started to read all of it? Yeah, because it looks bigger than I thought it. Yeah. Once I started. I mean, everything. Yeah, you... it's it, it's kind of it's kind of uh, bizarre. Uh, how many things there are out there like there's there's so much that no one person could possibly ever read all of this stuff um and i think that's i mean that's part of the problem with yeah, everything american stuff this is yeah yeah american right stuff. right 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 yeah it's not yeah. even counting yeah everything else yeah um but yeah i mean that's like kind of that's kind of the problem with everything it's like okay well uh authors who are writing novels and stuff they'd be it'd be much more likely that they could actually subsist on just writing novels if there weren't so many freaking novels published every year because it's like all the novels that have been published already still exist people are still catching up on reading those or you know never we're going to read them in the first place or just discovering them now whatever um but then like so many novels get published just every year that it's like it's impossible for any person to keep up with even any one genre but most people read in multiple genres and then so it's like what are, what's the hope that anyone could keep up with anything? And then so like when then you look at um, short stories where it's like um, there's even less money to go around or, you know, whatever, like um, it, it, it just becomes kind of ridiculous. Um, I, I mean, you would think that short stories would uh, be beneficial uh, in the modern era because, you know, we talk about our, our short attention spans, you know, like, you know, uh, social media has trained us to be like, oh, like, you know, <laughs> Like two sentences, you know, is what you get. Um, and so, but like, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like um, that's ever really caught on with people. There's like a lot of people still don't even know what a short story is, or know that people write short stories and publish them. You know, like if you talk to you talk to readers, they they could be big readers, but like you know, they're novel readers. Like that's that's the default thing that people read for you know, like for fiction is they read novels. They you know, uh, and a lot of people don't even know short stories exist. So, um, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just the I I wouldn't have guessed that it was as big as it is. Like you know the like the five thousand number range or whatever. Yeah. Like it seems ridiculous. That um, surprised me. Yeah. So.
Well, we have just a few more minutes left. Uh, yeah. Do you want, are there uh, any big projects on the horizon? Uh, maybe we could talk now about uh, the Jordan Peele anthology. Sure. This release. sure. And anything else on the horizon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, so, uh, you know, so yeah, the Jordan Peele book I just did. Um, so uh, Out There Screaming, um, I co-edited it with Jordan Peele. Um, and so that was super exciting. Um, Very handsome obviously. volume. Yeah, yeah, I, I really like how it turned out. It's uh, it's really got a really cool, cool really cool eye catching cover. Um, and they really went all out on the design on that. Um, but um, yeah, I mean that was just you know I was beyond did thrilled. Did he him? Did he come to you? Was this... no, no, no. So they uh, so Jordan and his team at Monkey Paw, they they conceived of the project. Uh, they sold it to Random House. Um, but then they wanted, uh, you know, an experienced editor in short fiction to work with them on the on the book. And so, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure who else was like considered or, or if anybody was even considered before my agent got wind of it and got me in front of them or whatever. But, um, you know, so actually so funny, funny thing. So like, you know, I said before, like how D&D is my favorite thing. So I was in the middle of a D&D game one night and my agent uh, had messaged me. Uh, saying like that we need a proposal for the for this peel thing like now like his like he was having a meeting with them the next day I'm like you know and it's like it pained me but I was like guys I, I have to drop out for like an hour or something and I gotta write this thing and you know <laughs> so so I had to I had to drop out of D and D for for a while to to work on that and and do it but but uh, like you know. But it was great. Like I, I felt like again, like with my best American pitch, I felt like I really nailed it. Like I, I knew exactly what to say and how to pitch it, and um, and I guess they agreed because they, you know, they they hired me on. But um, so but uh, so while while I was hired on for this project, I did have, you know, I did have my fingers in all the pies. You know, like I was, you know, we were partners doing the whole thing. Um, you know, I, you know, obviously I did a lot of the, um, you know, initial uh, like. Uh, I, I provided a lot of the initial knowledge base. Like I knew the writers that we could invite. And like, so I made lists and then we talked about like who we want to invite when we got the stories, we, you know, we read them and we, you know, we, we, can, we, we both, uh, you know, sort of chimed in on which ones we liked or which ones we didn't like, which ones we thought needed to work, whatever. And, and then like, you know, it was, it was a true collaboration, you know? Um, so, um, so like, you know, um, yeah, I, I feel like I, I, you know, uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, we co-edited it. Yeah. It's just like a, a true co-editing thing. Um, but, um, you know, it's funny that I, I did end up on this project though, because, um, I had, I had had the idea for this same book like years and years ago, like when, when Jordan first did get out, um, uh, and then like he ended up doing the twilight zone. I, I can't remember when exactly I had the thought, but it was like, I certainly by the time the twilight zone came out, I was like, Oh, well, no, he, look, look, he likes short stories. Like he, he needs to do this book. Um, you know, and, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I didn't really think that there was anything that I would do with it, with it at the time. But then when I had my novel imprint, I, I, I tried to pursue it like for real. And it was like, okay, well now I, I can, I can be the acquiring editor and get this to happen. But, um, but you know, we couldn't figure out how to reach them. And, um, so, you know, it just worked out though. So, Love um, it. yeah. Um, I can't wait to dig into it. Yeah. And, uh, John, thank you so much for joining yeah. me today. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, sure. You know, thanks for having me. I hope to have an opportunity to talk to you again. Yeah, yeah, this is fun. All right. Take care. All right. All right. Bye. Okay.